All right, let's get rolling. Welcome, everyone. This is the uh, the power of the group purchasing. Um, my name is Dan. I here at Marco. I am the solutions manager, and we we want to talk about is the power of group purchasing. And I thank you for all joining today and kind of being in this this meeting here with us. I hope you got something to drink for the next hour here because we got a lot of good stuff coming down the pipe. Um, let's. Let's go over what we'll be discussing today. Um, first of all, we'll have the CPC present. I can go back one more, Kim, please. First of all, we'll have the CPC present. Uh, that'll be led by Julia Dangerfield and Jerome Evans. Next up after that, we'll have Emma Washbush from Audio Enhancements. And followed by that will be Joe O'Brien from Avigilon. So CPC is the connection and the, the uh, purchasing program that you go through. And then the two solutions that we offer on there will be followed by Emma and Joe. So again, I thank you for joining. Look forward to what these individuals will be learning or teaching us today. And um, yeah, we'll get, we'll get going. Jerome, Julia, would you like, oh, actually, first of all, just to let you guys know a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions, please, the chat box is open. Please go in there and chat, and so we can answer that. And then also, this meeting will be recorded. And if you want to watch it again, you're welcome to. We'll post it on the YouTube channel, Marcos' YouTube channel, and also our website. So we'll get going here with Julia and Jerome to talk about the CPC. Ooh. Welcome. That's great. Thanks, everyone. So, um... As you can see here, we cover Minnesota and both the Dakotas. Um, how we were created was eight of the service cooperatives here in Minnesota came together to create Cooperative Purchasing Connection as their procurement agency. Um, if you work, there's a lot of little colored blocks. Those are the regional cooperatives. So if you're working with your regional cooperative, um, you might have heard to us re referred to as the co-op contract. Um, you can access the Marco contract either through your regional contract um, cooperative, your Marco rep, or by reaching out to Jerome and I. Um, even if you're not working with your local cooperative, you can still become a member of CPC and Jerome will tell you more about that later in the presentation. Um, so about us, we are a public nonprofit profit and we exist to help like entities. So schools, cities, counties, nonprofits, um, all of those agencies are able to access cooperative purchasing co contracts. Um, this is the tri-state team. So myself and Jerome, and then we've got Rosemary who covers North Dakota. Um, Jerome is based in the Metro. So he is covering quite a large region and then Southern Minnesota. I've got kind of rural um, Northern Minnesota, and then we both help with the Dakotas as well. And now I'm going to toss it over to Jerome for these last few slides. Yeah, and we um, we apologize if we're moving along too quickly. We've got a short amount of time to present a lot of information to you. But very quickly, I just want to let you know like why cooperative purchasing is the way to go when you're making a big purchase or going through um, a large project. Uh, it's efficiency. Efficiency is the name of the game. So what CPC does is go out to bid or run the competitive sealed solicitation process on behalf of every city, county, municipal, municipality, and nonprofit within that tri-state area that Julia showed you earlier. Um, so what we pool the purchasing power of all those entities to negotiate lower prices or member benefits with fantastic vendor partners like Marco. Um, this reduces or eliminates the duplication of purchasing procedures for you uh, because we've already done the work. So you, you don't need to go out to bid for something that we've already gone out to bid for on your behalf. Don't do that. You don't need multiple quotes. Just leverage a cooperative purchasing um, contract, ideally the CPC contract. Now, um, a big, big key thing here that you don't necessarily notice when you're looking at your spreadsheets is that this absorb we absorb 
the soft costs. So if you've never run a bid before, um, it's expensive. It takes a lot of your personal time to go out and kind of become a subject matter expert on that, that one item or that big project that you're trying to become um, an expert on that you need to run a solicitation for. Uh, and then the solicitation process itself takes a lot of time. So when you use the contract, you can just get started on your project and keep things moving. Speaking of, Julia, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so cooperative purchasing, when we do things on your behalf, that doesn't mean that you don't have any responsibility to make sure that we've done it properly. It's as if it's as if you've done it yourself, which means you need to make sure that everything is done right. All the I's dotted and the T's crossed. Now we have had our process, um, I'm gonna say inspected or reviewed by the auditor, but you know, as always, we want you to be careful. Um, this is what we do. We do the research, we attract potential vendors because you really don't wanna put out a solicitation and not have anybody respond. That's just a big waste of everyone's time. We draft the documents, we do the publications, there's a question and answer period, a response time where you literally just have to wait for people to respond. Um, the bid openings, evaluating the qualified responses is a big one. Uh, we typically convene a committee of uh, peers, so maybe people from different school districts or different muni municipalities, depending on the solicitation category, and we let them decide which of the responding vendors should be awarded. So the same process happened with Marco. Marco responded to a solicitation and we asked your peers uh, who out of the group of respondents should be awarded and your peers chose Marco. Next slide, please. Okay, so what makes CPC a little bit different um, we are very transparent. Like Julia mentioned, we are a like entity to you. Uh, so we are quasi-governmental and we, we just go ahead and give you all the info um, right there available for you to see. Now, what's probably gonna happen is you're gonna, you're gonna think back to this presentation um, when you're ready to move forward with a project. You're gonna be like, didn't that CPC guy tell me all this info was available? Um, you can ask your Marco rep for my info. You can. You can find us. We're very, we're very findable. Um, but the contract information is there on the vendor profile page. Those member benefits are there. The contracts, the two contracts, the Marco is one, is there. Um, a big thing on the right side of that image is with the arrow is uh, it says audit packet. So all of our work is there. Now this is about a hundred, hundred couple hundred page document. So it's uh, some light reading if you're feeling tired one day. Uh, but if your business manager has questions about our process, they are welcome to go and look. And then if you are a business manager and you know the one time you take vacation is when the auditor will come knocking. This is, there's no sign in required here. You just navigate to the page, uh, click on audit packet and all, all the info you need is there. And then of course the contact information for Marco is listed there. And we do meet regularly with Marco to make sure this information is up to date. Uh, we've all been in the situation where sales reps have changed. Um, and so we, we try to stay on top of that for you. Next slide. Okay, so where is that information? Uh, this is a screen grab of our website. You go to purchasingconnection.org. Uh, you hover over meet our vendors. The easiest way to get to Marco is the vendor list A to Z link. And then you just click on Marco. Uh, if, you, if you feel like going to the direct link, uh, it's purchasingconnection.org slash contract slash 278. Like I said, we're quasi-governmental, and so making things easy for you can be difficult for us. I apologize for that, but there is the link if you, if you want to take a screen grab. Now, okay. Julia mentioned uh, a participation agreement because we very frequently get asked how to become a CPC member. Now, if you remember from that slide earlier with all those colors, if you're in Minnesota and you're already a member of your service cooperative, your Minnesota service cooperative, then you're already a member of CPC. But if you're here, you're probably eligible to become a member of CPC without being a member of your service cooperative. Um, that same goes for uh, people in South Dakota and in North Dakota. 
Um, now, I'm not going to give you a direct link to the participation agreement now, unless you ask, uh, because, you know, it's all those steps like we just had before, but it is available. And I think that's the last slide from us. I apologize if I went over, but we will have questions available or time for questions at some point. Thank you, Jerome. I believe I am up next, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. Awesome. And let me know once you can see. Oh, Emma. Beautiful. Thank you. All right, my name is Emma Washbush, and I am the regional sales director for audio enhancement for Minnesota, North and South Dakota. I've been with the company for about a year now, but have worked with them for several, several years and I've gotten to really know the Marco family. A little bit of history of audio enhancement. If you don't know, is this woman in the middle in the green of this picture? Her name is Claudia Anderson. She is the founder of audio enhancement. She had two boys when they were born were profoundly deaf and told that they would never learn in a general education classroom. And Claudia was said, nope, not my babies. They are going to learn like any other student would in the general education classroom. So she went down this journey to learn audio and audio specifically in classrooms and how students learn. So what Claudia ended up doing for Justin and Jeremy was putting a microphone on a teacher and putting a speaker in Justin and Jeremy's textbook so that that way they could hear their teacher from wherever they were sitting in the classroom. Throughout the years of Jeremy and Justin throughout school, she started to get other parents asking for the same type of system. Then teachers asking for the same system. And she was saying, I don't do this. I don't make these. I just did this for my children so that they would be able to get an education just like any other student would. But then she realized that there was a real need for students to be able to hear throughout the classroom, no matter where the teacher is standing. So that's how audio enhancement was born. We're gonna go over all four of our solutions and you'll be able to see how we've really evolved throughout time. Here's a, a quick slide to show you guys how we are really in about 50% of the classrooms throughout the whole entire United States. It's showing that audio is just as important as any other part of learning. The four different solutions that we offer are for one, our audio solution, the one where the teacher wears the microphone, and then we install four speakers throughout the classroom to evenly distribute the teacher's voice. We also have our Epic system. That's our intercom paging and bell system. Throughout our journey, we realized that our schools didn't want to have one set of speakers for their intercom paging and bell system and one set of speakers for their classroom audio system. So that during that time, we learned that a lot of the intercom paging and bell systems aren't specific to K-12 and that they weren't catering their systems for schools. They were doing it for airports, for um, hospitals, for malls. So we decided to create, recreate the game and come up with our own intercom paging and bell system. That is the only intercom paging and bell system out there specifically for K-12. That's the only type of bell system that we create. We also have our safe system. That's where the teacher microphone acts as an alert button for the teacher if there's any type of instance in the classroom. And then our last one, is our view path system. That's cameras in the classroom. This is something that has really taken off since COVID. There's two different types of purposes that cameras go in the classroom. It's really for education first, safety second, or safety first, education second. So like I said, there's really four different solutions that we offer. It's classroom audio, intercom paging and bells, our EPIC system, our safe system, in our view path system. Now I'm going to dig into each of these systems a little bit further, and we're gonna start with classroom audio. A lot of people, what they don't realize is that we're not trying to make teachers louder, we're trying to make them clearer. So that way you can understand if a teacher is saying chop versus chop. Some of you may be, uh, 
know the inverse square law and some of you may not. So I'm going to talk to you guys about that a little bit. Think about a fire truck. When a fire truck is coming closer and closer and closer to you, what happens to that noise? It gets louder. When it goes further and further and further, it gets quieter. So classrooms have about, uh, they say a 65 decibels uh, noise level throughout it. So what teachers want to do, because they want to make sure Susie at the front of the classroom and Johnny at the back of the classroom are both getting the same type of audio from the teacher so that they are both getting the content. So what teachers do typically when they need everyone in the classroom to hear is they use their teacher voice. They want to make sure that Susie in the back can still hear her, like Johnny in the front. But what does that sound like to the person sitting in the front of the room? It sounds like the teacher's yelling when that's not at all what the teacher is trying to do. They just want to make sure that all of their students are hearing clearly. So with our solution, by putting on that microphone on the teacher and putting those four installed speakers in the classroom, you're evenly distributing the teacher sound by having them just use their normal tone and voice. It makes it clear for everyone to hear whether the teacher is writing on the whiteboard in the back of the classroom, speaking in the front of the classroom, or any student is sitting. Again, making the teacher clearer, not necessarily louder. Then we have our EPIC system, which is our intercom, paging, and bell system specific to K-12. Here are the, some of the system highlights. We first have intercom. That's that two-way communication so that that front office is able to talk into the classroom and the classroom can communicate back to the front office. We use a map-based system. So like we said, this is specifically for K-12. So all you can, all you need to do is simply click the classroom on the map and it'll be able to initiate that intercom call or there's a side panel to be able to say, okay, I wanna call into room 103. We also have paging which is a paging into a specific zone, meaning one-way communication from the front office into that zone that you're wanting to go into. So if you have testing, you want a testing zone where no pages or bells will go off in that, uh, in that area, you can go and page into that zone, whether it's the fifth grade wing, the fourth grade wing, the high school wing, et cetera. Now we have our bell schedule. I've never personally changed a bell schedule, but I heard it can be quite the headache for some people. With our bell schedule, for one, we set up the calendar so it runs August to July, so it's set up on a school year. All you need to do is simply click the day on the calendar and you can change it to a late start, a snow day, uh, schools canceled, etc., and then just hit save. It's as easy as two clicks. Our bell schedule can also be uh, adjusted. So let's say you do have a K through 12 school that the K, um, the kindergarten through eighth graders aren't getting the bells like the high school side of the uh, school is getting. It's adjustable. So if you have a testing area that the bells aren't going off at all for the kids in their testing zones. Then we have our school-wide notifications. That's using our EPIC system to be able to say, okay, we're doing a fire drill, a fire alarm, a tornado drill versus a tornado alarm, a lockdown and an all clear. It's showing that you can send off these notifications using our intercom system by hitting that button. And as if you guys may have noticed that there has been a phone icon right next to all of these options, we also have an application. So that way, some of your admin team that aren't in the front office right next, next to our 24 inch kiosk that they have access to this from their phone as well. They can create that intercom call just from the application on their phone. They can change the bell schedule. They can set off a school-wide notification. One thing that our EPIC system has the capability of doing is integrating with other types of systems, your common alerting protocol, your standard two-way open API, third-party device API, access control, door positioning data, your classroom interaction, your fire alarms, your school phones, your third party existing security cameras. This is showing that our system can make all of these other security systems talk. If someone pulls the fire alarm, that it will send off a notification through Epic, through our emergency alert system, which I do have a video later on to show you guys kind of how these all can talk to each other, that it can make sure that 
that all of these are communicating. So you kind of have one panel where you can see these actions taking place. The third um, system I talked about was our safe system. It's that alert button that is on the teacher from their teacher microphone. We actually got this idea from teachers themselves from saying, hey, this is the one thing that our teachers are wearing every single day. We don't wanna have to put another alert button on them. Can we have this microphone include some type of alert button? So that way, if there's an issue in the classroom that administrators or the front office can be notified. So we took that and we said, yes, let's do it. So there are two buttons on your side of your microphone. You hold them for two seconds and it sends off an alert to the front office or whoever has the application on their phone. It can be used for instances such as medical emergencies, disciplinary issues, parental situations, intruders, and other type of urgent situations. And how this looks from a classroom standpoint is the receiver. This is the brains of the classroom when you have classroom audio or intercom. There are three LEDs on your receiver. When you just don't set off a, a safe alert, it's just going to be green to indicate that your microphone is paired. Once you set off that safe alert, those three LEDs are going to turn red. The front office is going to get a notification that there is an emergency in that room and they are going to acknowledge it. What happens then is that those three LEDs are going to go from red, red, red to green, red, green. So nothing is happening out loud in the classroom. It's all being discreet. And I'm going to show you guys a short clip. And I know you guys won't have noise, but I'm going to kind of talk you through the scenario of what's happening. Teacher sets off a safe alert. It's going to be indicated in the front office. They're going to go ahead and acknowledge that that safe alert is going off. And now they decided to go into a lockdown based off that safe alert. We have emergency display takeover to notify everyone that we're going into a lockdown. And in this case, the school decided to have their door access to shut and lock interior and exterior doors. Very quick clip of how, how those can communicate to each other based on a school's protocol. We also have the ability to get text, emails, app alerts from um, any type of safe alert, any type of notification that would go off. We also have the ability to integrate with cameras in uh, the classroom. So I know that some people love this and some people don't, but it's becoming more of a conversation at, since COVID really. So how cameras in the classroom started was when a teacher would set off that safe alert, they wanted to be able to see what was happening inside that camera so that admins would be able to take the right next steps, whether it was a medical emergency, an intruder or parental situation, et cetera. They wanted to see what was going on inside that classroom. So we created our 360 camera. So what we say is our 360 camera is really for uh, safety first, education second. As COVID started up, as COVID entered our lives, really, then they decided to say like, hey, can I use that camera for educational purposes to record myself? So then that's when we created our PTZ camera, which we really say is for education first, safety second. So as you can see here, a safe alert was set off. We can see what's happening inside that classroom. This is where it shows our integration with uh, hallway security cameras. Audio enhancement does not do hallway security cameras. We only do classroom cameras, but you have the ability to integrate with them and see on your map. So if you can see on this map right here, we're able to click on that hallway security camera and get footage of what's happening inside, uh, inside that hallway right from your Epic kiosk. We also have our ITCs, which is our interactive touch controllers, which would be the little three by three touch screen that would live inside the classroom. What can happen with these three by three um, ITCs is that if a school decided to go into a lockdown, you would be notified by the lockdown symbol showing up on your ITC. 
And that way you can indicate if your room is secure or not. After you secure your room, you can do a head count of exactly how many people are actually in your room and send that to the front office. Once you're waiting throughout your lockdown drill, then you would be notified once you're actually in an all clear. From the front office standpoint, you would have a map of your school after um, a lockdown was initiated and you would be able to keep track of what uh, schools said that they were in an emergency. They would be indicated as red. What rooms have not responded at all, they would be indicated as yellow. And what rooms have responded indicated as green and they have that uh, total head count in there as well showing the total. So if you knew you had 200 people in your day or in your school that day, you have 37 students that were unaccounted for. And our last solution is that view path solution, which has really evolved throughout the years. If you would have asked us five years ago about putting uh, cameras in the classroom, people looked at us like we had three heads, but really since COVID, it has truly evolved and become more of a conversation that teachers and stu um, admins at schools are really taking more seriously. How that looks is you can initiate a recording if you're using it for educational purposes from your microphone. So what you would do is on your microphone, you can just hit simply hit that record button. How you indicate that a recording is started is that by receiver that lives in the classroom, that light is going to turn yellow. So teachers are aware if any recording has been initiated or their camera turns on. Totally aware because that yellow, that light will turn yellow. You can create content and upload it to your My Workshop if you know that student, it's a snow day and students, half the students are gonna be um, learning from home or you have stick students or students like to use that content to go back and um, review for future lessons for test exams, et cetera. You're able to record your lessons and upload that to your My Workshop. And then the last feature that is um, great with our uh, UPATH is that lesson capture. We have the ability to record the teacher and exactly what they're saying when they're walking around the room. The audio comes exactly from the microphone that they're wearing. And you're also able to create or uh, capture that content that they're talking about from the lesson themselves. So you have that two way if they're writing on their whiteboard and talking and walking around through the classroom as well as the content that they're projecting on their IFP or from their projector. And yeah, those are our four main um, offerings. And I know that uh, Dan said that we'll be going through questions at the end. So I'm going to skip that and I'll stop presenting so that we can move on to Joe. Thanks, Emma, I appreciate it. We can uh, work on the share here. And away we go. So thank you everybody for, for taking the time today, this afternoon. Obviously, you know, Marco and, and Motorola Vigilon has been a great partnership. Uh, we do appreciate that, that they see the importance in, in what we do and we see the importance in helping to try and keep everybody a little more safe and a little more secure. Um, we actually just launched a new, new, uh, I think it's called Solving for Safer. Is, is kind of our new program. So our entire goal at Motorola is to, again, solve for safer. How do we make facilities be a little more safe, a little more secure? Um, as they mentioned, I am with the Vigilon, which we're, we're a wholly owned portion of Motorola Solutions, Motorola in the public safety space. So think radios, 911 call center, that side of, that side of the house. Um, with the Vigilon, a couple of things with us is one, we are an end-to-end -end solution. So we do manufacture our own NVRs, so our own recording devices, our own software, and our own cameras. We are North American manufactured. So our primary manufacturing facility is just outside of Dallas, Texas. Um, but we do have a small manufacturing facility in, in Vancouver, Canada as well. Um, with that being said, the fact that we do end-to-end -end solutions um, and, and we manufacture everything ourselves. we didn't have zero mandatory annual fees on the on-prem solution. So once you have our system, we have our system. There's no ongoing maintenance cost. Um, and then what we're gonna run through today is we're actually gonna run through a little bit of the on-prem solution. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any uh, PowerPoint. We're just gonna look straight to the video, so hope everybody appreciates that. We're gonna spend the time today on the on-prem solution. Understand that we can do this in the cloud as well. So we have two different solutions. We have an on-prem and a cloud solution. 
Um, so we can do it in both spaces. Both of our solutions, even though our end-to-end -end are also open solutions. Um, like I said, we're gonna focus on the video security and video management today, uh, but there also is access control as well. So being able to get in and out of the school um, and then AI and analytics, will, you'll see in, in the video itself. So are we still good, Dan? Everybody see the, the actual Vigilant software? You can see it, Joel. Oh, fantastic. You know, trust but verify, right? We learned that at a young age. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I've got pulled up here is something that we would typically see in a school type of solution, all right, in a school system. We're gonna have multiple cameras up. You're trying to watch multiple feeds at once. We see this in the front office. Um, this is our actual, our, our doorbell camera, our video intercom camera. So I do have the ability in this camera. Oops. I do have the ability in this camera to unlock the door, but I seem to be having a little bit of an issue here. So I apologize for that, uh, but we'll come back live here in a second. Oh, there we go. So I have this button right here that allows great door access. So as you're watching live video, as people come in and ring the bell, you can see what's going on. You can talk down to them. It's got two-way communication. And then we can actually release the door straight from straight from the video side, as opposed to as opposed to having to go to multiple systems. So obviously that's going to depend on the access control and what we're tied into, but that capability is there. Um, so that is what we see in, in a lot of districts. So I just like to kind of point that out as we start here. Um, what we're looking at right now is live video. So this is live video of our Texas facilities. Um, for those of you with multiple facilities, I do like to point out that I am logged into three different sites right now. So the ability to log into multiple sites and view cameras from multiple sites in one setting is, is right here and available to you. Uh, live video, we're not gonna spend a ton of time on. I'm gonna spend a, a little bit of time on the quick searches. The biggest thing I hear, and not just in education, but kind of everywhere is when I have an incident, one, everything is, is um, it's very difficult to find, right? If something happens over the weekend, there goes eight, 10 hours of my day. Um, and the system's not really user-friendly. So one of the things I do like to point out is that one, our system is extremely user-friendly. You'll notice there's no keystrokes, there's a lot of mouse strokes. Um, and you know, after this, after you, after you get a taste of it, feel free to reach out to your Marco representative. We'd be more than happy to come out with them. We partner with them and kind of go through a more, more full-on demo uh, to show everything and kind of show you the true ease of use, but it really is easy, easy to use. Um, so we're here in live video right now. I have multiple tabs pulled up. Uh, one thing I do like to show in live video that does get used a lot is I can pull that same camera into multiple views. And the biggest reason that's important is I can go into recorded video in this camera while I'm live video here. So if there is an incident happening, I can actually start to review to see what's going on and what happened with that incident while I'm still watching live video. So I do like to point that out. The other thing that pops up when I do that is you'll notice all the blue bounding boxes. So those blue bounding boxes are our analytics. So Motorola and Vigilon, one of the things that we're most proud of is what we've done and grown with analytics. So what you'll see today is the analytics are gonna be person and vehicle based. So we're able to search on people, we're able to search on vehicles. What that allows you to do on top of that is instead of having strictly a reactive system, which is traditionally what video is, right? We have an incident, don't know it either happened five minutes ago or five days ago, but I got to go find out what happened. Uh, what the analytics allow us to do is be more proactive. So we can set up alerts and alarms based on people or based on vehicles, not based on just movement. So that's an important differentiator there is that, is, <laughs> unfortunately, who causes issues? People, how do they get their vehicles? That's why we're tracking those, those two different things. So as we roll through here, I do want to show a couple of quick searches. So if I flip over to recorded video, you'll notice that I can scrub video, which everybody's kind of used to and, and, and seems to be relatively normal. I can also hit play and I can hit fast forward eight times, which is traditionally what we hear when there's an incident, right? And that's where it's terrible is because when you start searching from Friday at five o'clock till Monday at eight in the morning and you're watching video at eight times speed, it's not enjoyable for anybody. So we try and make that a lot easier and a lot simpler. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to a single screen here and what we're gonna do is we're gonna find a vehicle. So this black vehicle right here, when did it get here, right? We know it wasn't there last night at midnight. We know it's there, we know it's there now. So what I have the ability to do in here is what's called a thumbnail search. 
And so this is not an analytic driven search. This is strictly taking a large space of time and breaking it down into small chunks for us. So where that's beneficial is we get a lot of lost items, left items, potentially stolen items, also damage over the weekend, that sort of thing, like when did this happen? So I have the ability to go and search 15 hours worth of video. And what it does is it breaks it down into smaller chunks for me. So now I know my car was there between 8.45 and 9.30. Again, I can do the same thing, break it down. Now I'm in a three minute increment. Do it again, now we're into a 15 second increment. I actually see my vehicle pulling in. So I can hit open and view and I can watch my incident. I can watch my car pulling in. I can scrub, scrub aways here and watch my person get out of the vehicle. And we found our incident. So traditionally what would take hours upon hours, we're able to search 15 hours worth of video in 30 seconds and go find our incident. So that's the power of the system itself. That, that, that's no analytic based at all. That's just the kind of the power of the system and how quick it is to go and find our, to go and find our incident. When we get into the analytics side and what the analytics are gonna allow us to do is instead of searching for just motion, which is traditionally what we would do, right? If we had an incident, there's no analytics there. We're just looking for motion. Motion's great until we get trees and lights and anything that changes pixels is gonna give us a result. And that's where our classified objects come in. And it allows us to search based strictly upon people, vehicles, or individual, or just strictly people, or strictly vehicles. So we can search both, we can search one or the other. So what my concern here is, if I go up here, I've got a walking path and a driving path up here, it's more for cars, but I do have people walking across there. I wanna see who's walking across there because we need to have a discussion with them about, hey, proper use, safety, whatever it is. Or it's just looking for somebody that, hey, they did something and ran out of the building and I wanna find out who they are and where they went. So if I just look for people in this area, I'm gonna search from that late Saturday through right now. So we're gonna search about four or five days worth of video. And it's just gonna give me results based upon people. So I'm not gonna get all these motion results. If I was to search that for motion, I'd be looking through thousands of results. What I'm gonna get here is somewhere, and we're, we're, we're close, I think. So we're gonna get somewhere between 45 and 50 results, I believe, but that's also six days worth of video. And we're just looking for people there. So as I hit play, I can just go through and I can search and I can look for people that were coming through the facility. And so you can see if they touch that bounding box, we're just getting people that are coming through there. Now, the nice thing is, is once I've found my person, the next question is, what do we do with them? For, what do we do with it at that point? So we found our person, this is our person that we're looking for. I have the ability to click on that person and go find appearances before this or find appearances after this. So what that's gonna do is it's gonna go search my analytic cameras and it's gonna look for that person. So as soon as I hit find appearances after this, it's gonna give me images that appear to be that person. And it's, it's not facial rec, but it's looking for body shape, it's looking for colors. So as I start to say, yep, that's my guy, that's my guy, we start to find our guy, we can star those results. It'll bring those results to the top and it goes and runs through searches again. So it looks again for similarities to that person again. So if we go here, we can star those results again. Again, it's gonna do the same thing. So as I come here and if we look at this image, the nice thing about the camera is you'll notice it found this person right back here in between the trees. So it's not, the person doesn't have to walk right in front of my cameras. I can find them wherever. So it found them, back here in between the trees. If I'm just strictly watching video, I'm probably not seeing that person. So we're letting the camera and the analytics do that for us. So very nice, very quick way to go and, and search and find where people went or where they're coming from. The nice thing is, is once I do that, I can actually export these all as one. So I get a single export. And what it looks like when you piece it together is it'll actually tie the different videos together. So for people that aren't familiar with your facility, we can actually watch and say, hey, look, here's what happened. This is gonna paint that picture of where that person went or where they came from or where that vehicle went or where it came from. So people have an understanding of, hey, this, this makes sense. It paints that picture of the facility in your head. So 
so with that, unfortunately, we don't always know where that person started or where that person came from. Um, if we can't find them, but sometimes we do get, uh, you know, the bolos be on the lookout. So we do have the ability to do a parent search based on that too. So I can search based on a person. I can search a male child. I can do upper body and lower body body coloring. So they're wearing white shirt and black top. I can choose my date range and my cameras and I can perform an appearance search based off of that too. So again, where the system, the system's really good by itself, but where it is really powerful is the analytics and that speed to go in and find situations and find, find issues. Um, and then help solve them quickly because time is of the essence in a lot of these situations. If there is um, a missing child, lost child, whatever happened in the school district, hey, you know, they didn't make it home on the bus today, what happened, to be able to go back and find that and find that quickly uh, and be able to get those answers helps solve a lot of issues. And finally, what we do have as well is based on those analytics, like I discussed earlier. So based on people and based on vehicles, we can create analytic areas. We can create them based on time. We can create line crossings, one and two way line crossings. We can do multiple things with those analytics. So what we've developed is what's called focus of attention. So if you'll remember the first screen that we looked at, the first screen was 17, 17 videos, right? And it's very tough to watch 17 videos at once to find out what's going on. What focus of attention does is it takes those analytics and alerts us when it finds an issue or when it finds something that we've determined is, hey, I want to be alerted on this or, hey, I want to be alarmed to this. So you can see we've got some of these set up where it's a person leaving the parking lot. We've got social distancing, so people were a little too tight together. Um, unusual activity, that license plate matches. There's actually our facial rec. So we do have facial rec, that's an added feature. Um, that's not standard, that's something that's a little bit added, but it is there and capable. So you can see the reference image and the actual image itself. He's not really a bad guy, he's in our demo facility, that's just a, a, a demo piece there. Um, but we've got people loitering, we've got cars traveling the wrong direction here, cars going right to left as opposed to left to right. So you can be alerted to all of these incidents, you know, hey, we've got somebody's coming in a door during the day that's supposed to be outgoing only or somebody's going out a door during the day and hey we want to go grab them and bring them back into class um, so there's multiple things we can do it's just another layer of being able to not watch video because it may or may not be your primary job um, but a lot of times it's not so instead of trying to watch live video we let the system do it for us create these alerts um, they can be set up in focus of attention, they can be sent to your phone, they can be sent to email, they can just bookmark in the system. There's multiple things we can do with it. But the analytic driven is, is like I said, is really where we're going and to try and make this a little more proactive than what video traditionally is. So with that, I will pass it back to Kim. And thank you everybody for the time. Perfect, Joe, I appreciate it. All right, well that, uh... That kind of concludes all of our um, presenters here. So, um, why why Marco? Right? You know, we we could you can see with these presentations how technology has really tied everything together. Um, from peering in the classroom and in equal education, where that ties in with door access and video cameras and security, and how the technology kind of creates and making an ease of use for you. Right? So, excellent job. Emma, and excellent job, Joe. I appreciate your guys' um, presentations there. And CPC, you know, with them, we created all this partnership, right? So it's it's a relationship between all of us to help you as a customer make it an easy process, right? Fast, easy, and, and get your solutions implemented so that you can start using the technology to make your day and life easier. So appreciate you, uh, Julia and Jerome, going through your presentation. Um, if you guys have any questions or are interested, you know, always reach out to your Marco rep. They're there to help you out and, and take care of uh, any of your needs that you may have. And um, we can open it up for questions, I think, right now. Kim, we're good on that. Good on questions. So the first one we have is for the CPC team. So if they're not in that tri-state area, can an entity actually join um, the uh, CPC as well and use that uh, contracts? Yes, they can. That's a, that's a little CPC secret that we don't go out advertising. Um, but yes, CPC can be uh, used nationally. Um, and it's the same participation agreement. 
Now, I will say that we do play well with our other uh, sibling cooperatives around the country. Um, and so what we like to do when we partner is return a little bit of any uh, funds generated from using the CPC contract to your local cooperative. Um, so that it, it stays local for you as well. Got it. Good question. Um, for the audio enhancement products, do you have to purchase these all at once, um, Emma, or can you buy this one at a time? Um, yeah, so that's a question we get often. So you, it's not an all or nothing. It's super buildable. So some schools say, okay, classroom audio is the need today. Intercom paging and bells is the need tomorrow or vice versa, or they want to start with two of the th or two of the three or three of the four, whatever, but it's super buildable based on budget, based on what your needs are. Perfect. And just a reminder, if you have any questions, please drop those in the chat. We are um, actively looking at those or so getting some coming in. So I have a question for Joe now. So, Joe, for the security systems that you were showing, are they a closed or open system? And can you work with other cameras? So on the on-prem system, we are 100% open system. So our cameras, our software, our NVRs will work with other cameras, softwares, NVRs. So we are a completely open system there. One of the unique things about Motorola and where we are on our, on our Vigilant Alta side, which is our cloud-based side, is I believe we're the only cloud video company today that is an open system. Traditionally, your cloud companies have been all closed systems, so it's a complete rip and replace. And on the Vigilant Alta side, we are an open system, so we can actually use leverage existing cameras that are in place if you do want to go to, to the cloud. Okay. And then um, another question for you is that, well, for the FISEC system, can you have more than one administrator or like what's the administration um, analytics side look like? That was for me, I'm sorry. Yes, that was for you, sorry. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yes, you can have multiple administrators. Everything I showed today can be turned on and off per end users. So you can have different levels of end users. Um, we have definitely have end users that have the ability to just watch live video. We have, you know, that, that can go live and recorded. Then we have uh, a lot of places, especially in education, limit who can export video. So everything can be turned on and off per end user. And yes, you can have multiple admin, uh, depending upon your layout and how you want to set up. Perfect. And then we have a question for you um, for audio enhancement. Uh, do you come and, and train teachers on how to use the systems um, once it's installed? We, we do. So we have the ability to buy you could, um, We do offer some free trainings, but for more in depth trainings, we do virtual and on site trainings. Perfect. Um, and then for SNC, the CPC, I know you guys talked about this, but um, so if they are um, having to obviously meet those like, uh, you know, government standards, right? And, and those standards, like you guys, your contracts will uphold that if that goes through audit and that kind of stuff. Someone was just wanting to make sure. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Okay. Well, as I say, I think um, I'm going to wait for just one more minute to see if we have any additional questions. Those were some really good ones. Um, so just a reminder, if you don't have one, we'll give you your 10 minutes back and we'll end a little bit early. Um, so Dan, looks like we don't have any more questions. So I'll just let you wrap it up. Perfect. Well, I appreciate everybody jumping on here and taking your afternoon to learn a little bit about CPC, audio enhancements, and a Vigilon. And I appreciate your time today. So enjoy the rest of your day.